Good morning, good afternoon, folks. Today we are meeting uh, yet another presentation of our DBA Fundamentals Group. This time on SQL Server Farm Management versus Single Instance Management um, from one of our uh, sponsors, DB Watch. This time the speaker is per, Christ per Christopher Undum. Hopefully I said that name right. I am always really bad with names. Sometimes I even get my own name wrong, so please forgive me. Um, as you see here, our uh, leaders of the group are Steve Cantrell, Shane O'Neill, Warwick Rudd, and myself, Kevin Wilkie. You can get in touch with us via many different um, ways. Obviously, our most preferred uh, way is or you can reach to us on uh, Twitter. We're at DB, DBA Fun. We have our own Slack channel, uh, which is very, very, uh, lots of people come to it and ask lots of great questions. You can always view this presentation or many other of our past presentations on the, our YouTube channel, SQL Pass TV, as well as many other presentations from other past virtual groups. Or we can connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, right below there is the is our group page where we try to send out uh, information um, fairly frequently. Today's presentation is brought to you by DB Watch Database Control. Their enterprise manager is a complete solution for database administration, monitoring, performance tuning, security, license management, and a whole lot of other things that you really get a kick out of actually using the product. It is um, a great product I've used a few times here recently. I need to get playing with it more and more and seeing what more and more it can do for me, but it is truly a great solution. It will help you in your day-to-day -day job as a DBA. Please remember that very soon, I believe it's actually next month, we will have Pass Summit 2020, which is be virtual this year. Um, so you can, this since it is virtual, you can now um, view it wherever you're seated. Uh, you can be traveling across the country, like I will be here rather soon and participating in all of Pass Summit 2020 without having to go to where it would have been this year. Um, with that, please remember to use our discount code for DBA Fundamentals. Uh, it helps you receive uh, $50 off of the three-day registration, not the uh, five-day, the pre-cons, whatnot. This is just for the three-day registration. Um, please go to the PASCA.org website, sign up for the discount code, it will help you save some money, which is always a good thing. As I said earlier, today's presentation is brought to you by Christopher, uh, where you probably have seen this, um, this abstract here recently, talking about uh, what today's presentation will be about. And I know I'm excited to view it. So with that, I hand it off to Christopher. Christopher, all yours. Thank you. So my pleasure. Let's see if I can uh, present my screen. Um, uh, can you uh, set the present presenter to me, please? So um, it's still on the PowerPoint, yeah. So let's see here. Is this viewable for everybody? Yes, there we go. Excellent. Yes, uh, welcome to this presentation. My name is Per Christopher Undheim and I work as a DBA at uh, DB Watch. Uh, the topic I will talk about today is called Beyond Instance Tuning optimizing SQL Server farms. And this talk is structured so 
I will first compare farming to database management and how we are getting into a situation that uh, in many ways are solved by farmers already. Then we will learn from their solutions and how that applies to SQL Server farm optimization and tuning. And finally, we dive into the technical details on how uh, this can be done in practice. So there is a lot of concept, uh, concepts relating to running a farm that is not tuning or optimizing and um, that I could uh, go into, but I won't go into that today. But first, we need to step back in time. Some years ago, a farmer could be living quite happily with four cows. They would have names like uh, Rose, Flower, Daisy and Bella, and the farmer knew each and every cow, talked to them every day, uh, milked them into a bucket and cleaned up after them. But no farmer can make a living like this anymore. And in the same way, some years ago, a DBA would only work with a few database servers where the DBA would know them all and their function and could log in and check them every day. And I remember how this used to be. I could set up and configure the hardware for my database servers, and I could spend days or even weeks tuning and adjusting for any minimal improvement. Those were the days, but they're not coming back. This is 42 cows. It is not an uncommon uh, heard for one farmer to work with today. However, I think that this is around the time where they don't feel they have a strong and personal relationship with each and every cow. And this is also the time that you start uh, using names like 578-47563812-4 uh, uh, to name their cows. You know, this being a cow from, from Norway, 578, farm identifier 47563812, and cow number 32. And at this point, you will still know a few of the cows, you know, maybe the ones that have a special pattern on their hide. But you can't pet each and every one anymore. You can't milk them by hand. It takes 30 minutes to milk a cow by hand. This has to be done at least twice a day. So 42 cows means 42 man hours per day. And it can't be done at any time. It's usually you have to do it in the morning and the evening. So maybe you need 10 people involved just to milk. And of course you need machines to help you with milking and the other process of processes of managing the cows. Without machines, the cows would be neglected and suffer and the farmer would suffer too. And we see that the skill set of the farmer has changed from being an expert in milking by hand and, and measuring the food for each cow based on experience and, and knowing the personality of each animal so you can tell if something is wrong. That is not so important anymore. But, but operating the computer that controls the milking machine, adjusting feeding robotics and integrating cow metrics with automated veterinary systems are. This is 42 database instances. And this is around the average of what we see one DBA work with today. And same as for the cows, for me, this is around the time where I don't feel I have a strong personal relationship with each and every one of them. This is also about the time where we start using names like db-ws8-s-32 to name our servers to encode information about them or metadata into their server names. We're trying to build structure and control. And this would be a database server with Windows SQL Server 2008 located in Stavanger server number 32. And still at this point, you will know a few of the instances, but usually only the ones that cause problems. And only by the power of scripts and Excel, you will know the IP address and the version and session count from, from last week and the disk usage some time ago and, and memory usage from God knows when. You'll be sort of in control some of the time, but not always and not maybe when it needs to be. And 
a lot of DBAs will find that the number of database instances they manage is higher than what you can check in a day. Then your control starts slipping away and the reactive DBA work and, and uh, putting out the fires takes precedence over the proactive DBA work that would have kept everything running all the time. And if you manage this without the right tools to do so, the databases will suffer, your users will suffer, and you will suffer. And we see also the skill set of the DBA has to change from being an expert in tuning large SQL statements or, or man, manually tweaking memory settings or creating your own scripts to, to fix reoccurring problems. This skill set is going away. Automation, consistent deployment, standardization, farm management, other things will be valued. This is what 170 instances looks like. And the DBA here would maybe not know that there was 170 instances. If you ask them, they would say, we have many database instances, and you'll get a rough number. A DBA no longer have time to log in and manage each individually. They need tools to provide the overview of the entire database farm. And when the database farm gets to this size, your DBA will struggle to rely on their own customized scripts. As the size grows, the number of platforms and versions will increase, making it more difficult to build and maintain his or her own tools. Maybe creating and maintaining the scripts will be a full-time job. And you can't, as a DBA uh, at this point, spend any length of time tuning the individual instances. There will be enough running around trying to fix and preventable crashes to allow for any proactivity, let alone tuning. This is a database farm with 1,200 database instances and what it looks like in PowerPoint. And you will know that here they will all be named something nearly identical. And you know you have a farm when you need software just to count them. Now, the skills we mentioned earlier, automation, consistency, standardization, farm management, it's impossible to manage this well without. So how, how can we optimize this sort of environment? What is the things that we focus on when we optimize one instance? We could make sure that the hardware has enough CPUs and the memory and the disk is right size for this application. And you can set up and you can configure the instance uh, to utilize the hardware correctly, tweaking memory errors and parameters. And we tune the SQL statements to improve performance and much, much more. But for what? Optimizing one instance is optimizing for hardware utilization. When we look at optimizing a farm, the focus changes to areas such as standardizations and standardization and consistency, you know, comparing and monitoring differences in your environment, adjusting automatically settings that need to be identical, and comparing versions and patch levels so you know when something is out of sync, and the detecting and adjusting instances that are not consistent. And you have automation where all maintenance routines are deployed and working identically on all database instances. And adjustments to tuning are deployed across the farm. And fixes that are possible to predict can be implemented automatically. And you have improved workflows where you help the DBA prioritize what is the most important tasks and alerting the right part of the organization about the problem and improving the time used to correct issues. And for what? Optimizing a farm is optimizing for DBA time. Optimizing DBA time will lead to benefits in performance and resource usage. Just as a milking machine optimizes primarily the time a farmer uses to milk cows. But you get benefits in increased milk production per cow because milking is consistent. It's not too early, it's not too late. And also it's monitored and measured. Optimizing DBA time leads to benefits of overall performance improvement 
and the resource usage because you get compounding effects on the tuning that is done because it's done across the farm. The database instances you are running in your server farm is usually all running on a few physical servers and they're eating the same resources. So performance tuning on the entire farm reduces overall load and helps you better target the resources you have where it's needed and also saves costs. And we know that from tuning the, an individual instance, the, the lesson is that uh, tuning uh, is, uh, is the law of diminishing returns. Focusing the efforts on uh, tuning the easy wins on a lot of instances will be a better use of your time than squeezing the last drop of performance out of one of your instances. And tuning efforts that can fix problems across the farm will add up. A 10% improvement on all your instances really stack up. Well, sometimes in life, we have an opportunity to start all over. We start with the right skill set to how to run a farm, and we can set up the right foundations and structure before we start getting cows or, or database instances. But most of the time, this is not the case. We start looking into this when we are in the process of being overwhelmed by the cows or, or the database instances we have. We know we need to take action to move from having cows into running a farm. We need to move from managing databases to managing farms. And, and what would you start with as a farmer? Well, if you have cows that doesn't produce milk, you need to send them to the slaughterhouse. They are better used as a steak. And this is quite obvious. If, you, if they don't make milk, how can you keep feeding them? It should be that obvious when we manage database farms as well. Still, we see that this job is not often done in the world of database farms, but the job is quite similar. You all have databases that are not in use anymore. But while new databases are very easy to get, old databases seem so hard to get rid of. But why is this so hard? Of course, it might be easier to see if a cow doesn't produce any milk, but that is only because it's being monitored and measured. You need to monitor if your databases are being used. And how can you keep your farm running optimally if you don't know what information is important and in use and which is redundant? What is your process of making sure that all your data is relevant? If you have 100 instances with 100 databases on each, that is 10,000 databases. And which one doesn't produce the milk anymore? This is a list of databases not in use where nobody logs in, no changes are made, nobody reads the data, and for quite some time, it's a waste. You are wasting food, which is your CPU, your memory, your disk, your backup space, and most importantly, your time on looking after databases with data no one uses. And once you know, it is easy to put them offline. Wait to see if anybody is screaming, and then make sure that you have at least one good backup before you remove them. And this can even be automated. But you can also check which databases are in use so you know their activity level and importance. So now that you are left with cows that produce milk, it's time to look at managing the time you spend better. You wouldn't run this farm with uh, and milk them by hand. So, of course, we, we, we bring in the robotics. And there is robotics for a database farm too. The super DBA that logs in to rebuild indexes or repeat fixes, that time must be used better. Automated maintenance of index rebuild, reorganization, fragmentation, automate backups, automate routines to adjust known settings and performance issues automatically from a central location. You need standardized 
and monitored automation. And once it's deployed, you need to be able to quickly see if your automation is running perfectly. This is uh, index rebuilding across the farm. And as you see, one of the instances have an index that is too large for automatic rebuilds. This is defined in your standards. It could be uh, that it is uh, it will affect the uh, database uh, users. But this could be a job you need to do when there is a scheduled maintenance period. Or DBCC check DB. You know it has to be done. And if there is an issue in the maintenance, you need to know right away. Maybe it's uh, maintenance jobs that can uh, can't complete uh, within their allocated time frame, or, or there's other errors. And what more would the farmer do? Did you know that in modern farming, all cows have their own medical journal? That the milk from each cow is analyzed for any medical issues and the antibiotics is adjusted in their food for each cow based on that findings. And if you can't auto adjust or detect medical issues that require the veterinary to check it out, the farmer gets notified. We must do the same. Standardized monitoring, farm-wide deployment, any health issues that can't be corrected right away must alert the right person. Before anyone else notices, the DBA can then enter and save the day. But maybe also adjust the automation to catch and correct reoccurring problems. If you need to fix something twice, the third time should be automated. Because repeating the same task over and over again is not optimizing DBA time. It also introduces the chance of it not being fixed in time and that problems are affecting end users. And once you know how all the instances are behaving, you can relax with the instances that have no problem and focus your efforts on the instances that are reporting problems. So if you have healthy cows that are producing milk, you might want to analyze the milk production and improve it. But what type of type and amount of food is best to achieve for your farm? A farmer would look at his computer screen for the output metrics uh, for milk per cow and, and the resource settings for the feeding robotics and then adjust, maybe just for one cow or maybe for the entire herd. A DBA would do the same. You look at the performance dashboard and you find if databases are misbehaving and then you adjust their food, their CPU and memory and, and uh, disk space and, and check if you're getting better results. What you want to do here is finding what minimal tuning can be done to benefit the entire farm. Maybe one or two database instances need special attention as they could be impacting others too. You need both a total overview of the resources you are using and the ability to check the activity and memory allocation and to make sure that the instances are using the right amount of memory. Adjusting memory on an instance can also be auto-tuned if uh, they get, so that they get allocated the memory they use and when there is less load, it's auto-tuned to a lower setting. Or you could look uh, if there are instances with databases that are fighting internally for resources. This can have result in unexpected performance changes on the database instance. It's important to stay on top of how the farm is working, to stay in control and to work on proactive DBA work, how to avoid having problems in the future. And there is a reason why farmers focus on one breed. The breeds are different and needs different food, produce different milk, and are some are best suited for steak. And multiple breeds makes it difficult to streamline the farm. And like the farmer focuses on one breed, 
a DBA must try to standardize versions and patch levels and platforms as much as possible. You need to get an overview of your versions and patch levels and employ consolidation as an ongoing procedure to make your farm always right-sized. And when you have an overview of what is running and what versions, you could use it to plan for a better structure. Overview is essential for good decision-making. And you can combine this with reporting on both, both to let management know you're doing a great job, but also reports for yourself that looks through the resource usage so you know which instances can be combined. Moving from database instance management to SQL farm and management requires us to think in new terms on how we look at and compute, communicate with the databases. Uh, we required a different language to define uh, what we want to look at and how it should be presented. So farm management and farm optimization requires much more that we looked on today. But how do we take control over SQL Server farms? We needed to make something new to control the farm. So we have created a query language to make this possible. A new way to bring together all the data we can find across different database versions, platforms, and indeed all data sources. Before we can optimize the SQL Server farm, we need control. To understand how this works, we need to go back to how we communicate with databases today. If I want to know anything about the database instances uh, I have, I need to query the databases. And for this use case, I have four database instances, Manda, Silos, Cecid, and Tatooine. They're all SQL Server database instances. And four is not that many database instances to manage. What I want to know today is how many user sessions are connected to each database instance. And uh, to do that, I need to run a SQL query. And I have a query I want to run that counts up the number of user ses sessions they have. It's highlighted here in red. And this is my favorite SQL Server counting sessions, but not the background sessions and task manager query. So, I run this query on each database instance, and then the results of the queries has to be copied from my SQL query output and pasted into an Excel spreadsheet for analysis. And you will end up with something like this. I think this is something most DBAs do regularly. It's quite straightforward and it's easy to do. And when you don't do it all the time, and when you only have four instances to manage, but it is boring and it is repetitive. And sometimes you might have another database platform you need to report on as well. Like when you still have some reluctant Oracle instances that you haven't been able to remove yet, like Tanab here. Or you have a query that is not compatible across different versions of the database platform. And there could also be cases where you have one, uh, some SQL servers on premise and some new databases in Azure. I think that this is the reality in many places. And often when I worked as a DBA in the past, I got responsibility for not only the database platforms I knew pretty well, such as SQL Server or Oracle, but also some platforms I hardly knew at the time, such as MySQL and Sybase. They were left over from some old piece of uh, software that I hoped I never needed to fix. But I still needed to report on them and to make sure that they didn't stop working. And what you end up then uh, with, uh, what you end up with then is multiple queries you have to run. One on some instances and uh, others on the rest. You also need to keep track on what query should be run in which instance. So in this case, I only have SQL Server and Oracle, but there is still, still two different queries that do this exact same thing. They, they count the users, but not background sessions from a database instance. And for each metric we want to look at, there is a new query. So we have two different queries for the instance name, two different queries for the session count, which we looked at earlier, two different queries for disk usage, and two different queries for memory usage. So 
only when we want to look at these simple metrics, like the instance name, the session code, the disk usage and memory usage, and we only have two platforms, we end up with eight queries we need to maintain and understand and use to query the data we need. And we need to pick the right one to run at that instance. So we need to know the instances we manage quite well already. And that can be a problem in itself as, as we look into later. I think most DBAs have a long list of these SQL statements that they use to gather different bits of information from the database instances they manage. And when you get bored of the manual job of running the query and copying and pasting the result, you start looking into ways to avoid this manual labor. So maybe you make them into a view or you join them together. So at least you don't have to run all the queries independently and you end up with something like this. It's our four metrics for each database platforms joined together, or it's more like stitched together. But this has a drawback. As a DBA, you will end, likely end up with many of these nice to have, but very complicated queries. And I have spent many hours looking for the comma that was, that was missing or the single quote that turned into a back tick or the parentheses that went missing. And you might also turn this into a script, but that's very inflexible. As when somebody asks you for a new metric, you have to dive into all code with a lot of complex queries to sort out. So when we find a good query, wouldn't it be nice if we could just create an alias for each of the queries? So when we need the result of that query, we just ask for the alias instead of having to merge and join dif difficult queries together. Say we, we give the name of the instance query the alias name and the query beyond session count, uh, total session count, and uh, the query for disk usage, uh, disk usage, and uh, the memory usage query, uh, the alias memory usage. And this way, at least when we have found the right query, it stays right. And if we need uh, to correct it, it's just a simple query that can be easily understood. So imagine just running this simple query on each database instance, just querying the alias and having the aliases automatically resolve the different queries for the different platforms and versions. Wouldn't that be a good idea? There is a natural way of structuring these aliases. Some concepts like memory usage and total session count have a single value that is associated with that instance. But other concepts like uh, agent jobs is a list where each element of the list has a set of properties. This results in a structure similar to a directory structure used to organize files on the disk or a tree-like structure of an XML document. FDL is a language created to transform this type of information into queries. Each of these nodes is a result of a query. So in the case of total session count, there is the same SQL query I used manually on the four instances, but when it's defined as a node in the farm data language structure, instead of running it manually on each database instance, it's queryable as a value of a property in the structure tree. We define this in XML as a property which has a key and a value. Here the key is total session count. And to limit the queries to run only on database types that this query work on, it has a compatibility tag. Uh, it is in its, itself a query on, on the different uh, properties, in this case, the database type. This allows a, a given property key to have multiple definitions so that uh, each database type might get their own SQL query. So now the problem we had earlier where we needed to remember to run the right queries for the right database platforms and versions is taken care of. This is a very important part of how this can function, function on multiple database platforms and versions. Compatibility allows for multiple queries to gather the same type of data from multiple sources. Any property can be a compatibility tag, so you can also make a, another property definition later based on the total session count so that that property only would run on database instances with more than 100 sessions connected, for example. Then we have the value definition and 
this is what will give the property key, total session code, its value. And it says it's a SQL engine to run, and it's a SQL statement, just like the one we run in our SQL worksheet. And the last parameter here is valid for, which is a cache hint. This is how long the value is valid for before we should start a new SQL query to get fresh data. Here it's set to one minute since the information about how many user sessions are uh, connected to the database instance, that changes quite rapidly. For other queries that are heavy or doesn't change that often, maybe a valid for of 24 hours is the correct setting. This parameter is important to offload the database instances when you have uh, data that needs to be queried frequently. FDL is somewhat similar to a directory path. It's a bit like directories and files. If you want to get a value, we type the path and the value is returned to us. So we start uh, with a simple query. We ask for the name of the instance. This is a similar query in, in FDL as when we did the individual SQL statement and put it into Excel. So we just write instance slash name and we get the the value for the property name for each instance. In the background, the SQL statements for the name property is run on each instance, and the answer is, is cached if we should query this again in the near future. Then we can add column formatting so that the column that is used, used to be called name is instead formatted as database instance. And this is the same that we do in SQL statements when we want to give the column headers a better name. And now we add a new concept, an anchor. This is a reference pointer that allows us to join two properties together. The instance node is anchored in the I variable. And this allows us to start from the same node item each time we query a sub node or tried node in the tree. We will use this in the next step when we add a column to the query. So, we use $i to refer to the same instance element again when we query the, for the value of total session count, formatted as session count. Now we have joined two properties in such a way that both the value of the database instance name and the value of the session count refers to the same database instance. If we didn't use this to connect the two properties, it would just be two columns that were not connected. It could be the name of one instance and the session count of another uh, instance. So since we use an anchor, we open the possibility to query multiple values at once, starting from the same node item. For instance, if we also want uh, the disk usage value displayed alongside the database instance name and the session count. This allows us to put together information from many different queries into one result set. Now we have added disk usage alongside in the, this query, and we get a view that contains multiple key metrics for the for a database instance. And now we have something that could solve our initial problem of querying and merging data from multiple database instances using the different aliases. It's it is in fact a bit like how a data warehouse work, where multiple queries extract data and transform them to connect together and allows you to query on top of that data. But with FDL and a caching engine, this is now on the fly and in real time and really easy. So every time you have a new alias you want to create, it's just a few lines of code in a file and new items can be queried across all your database instances. But even though we mostly talk about SQL queries, this can also take input from other sources as well. As we see in the definition of our query, in the, in the property definition, the type of engine is set to SQL. The reason for this is not to limit this functionality to SQL queries only. Maybe you have, a, uh, have information located elsewhere that needs to be added into the view. It could be that uh, information is located on the host machine itself, or maybe on a web server. Or you could have a mix of data that needs to be put together. And sometimes the information you get from your query is not formatted correctly for the value you want to give the property. 
and then you need a processing engine. So this flexible query structure enables multiple engine definitions where one in engine can feed data into another. So uh, for query engines such as uh, SQL or SSH or other FDL queries, you can then feed data into processing engines like uh, regex for JavaScript. And I'll look into a few examples on what it's looked like. So this is an example that uses SSH to query the host of a database instance for its host name. The only major change from the SQL property is that it's now compatible with the OS type Linux and the engine name is SSH. And the query is now a command that is executed by the shell on the database instance server. And this is a more advanced example that uses an SSH shell command where the output is then passed to another engine, in this case, a regex engine as input. This is a waterfall type model where the engine line on top feeds data to the engine line underneath. And the queries are run in the order they have in the definition. Then the structure of a node and its child node nodes are defined from the results of the regexp. Multiple engines can then be combined to create advanced properties that merge information together. In a way like a data warehouse system with the ETL extract, transform and load, this is completed on the fly and on demand. So it's also possible to add programming logic into this, where a JavaScript routine will process the data that is gathered by other queries. Uh, in this case, uh, a SQL query that selects a text, URL text, uh, from a table called URL info in the database dbwatch. And then this is given an out scope, which is a reference name that predefines a variable in JavaScript. And we can uh, get a string from the FTL query into the property call, uh, called metadata underscore URL, URL string. And this is given the out scope string to find. Uh, yeah, so both of them are used in the JavaScript routine that downloads the contents of a web page URL and checks for a string. Uh, the result is then processed uh, in the if else logic, and then uh, the property value is set accordingly. There are many benefits from multiple sources and post processing. And one important benefit is uh, the integration with organizational data. So most companies have a lot of data about the systems they manage. This data can be in many different locations and sources. And when you uh, want to export data again from uh, you need uh, for reporting purposes or, or maybe straight into Excel, this is uh, the data you export is then can then be enriched with information such as uh, customer name, database location, SLA requirements or links to documentation. So there is other areas of farm management as well, but um, I won't go into them in detail to get today. And there are several areas that we could address uh, managing a database farm. It's, mu it's much more than just the optimizing I've looked into today, and there is much more to optimizing as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to look into if you want to reproduce and improve the automation that is done when farmers manage cows into the world of databases. And yeah, I know maybe my clip art isn't the best, but um, uh, just like running a cattle farm has moved from the old ways of uh, manual labor into something more like a factory producing milk and meat with industrial methods and machines that help the farmer. So will the world of database administrators move from uh, um, into the role of the data manager. The ever increasing amount of data and sources of data will force this to happen if it hasn't uh, happened already. And here the DBA will need to refocus their skill set from manually tweaking and individual tailoring to standardization, consistency, automation, and control. And that is the end of my talk. Do we have any questions? Hi, yeah, we have a few actually. 
so let's see if I can up here again. Uh, you mentioned uh, on your slides about uh, one of the servers on the farm had an index that was too big to rebuild. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to configure what that level is? Like what's too big, what is too, uh, what is like not big enough? Of course, it, it, you will set up a, a standard uh, setup for for um, for all the um, to, uh, for indexes too large to rebuild automatically or too small or uh, the the index skew. Everything is of course adjustable uh, so that uh, you will uh, create your um, the standard. Of course, you get a default um, setup that is. Um, is accepted by 90 or 80 percent of people but then you can adjust that to your individual needs okay. perfect yeah um somebody's asking if there is a way to uh, uh find servers um or do you have to input like an inventory no this is um um, well, if you think about DB Watch, there is auto discovery functions and bulk install and uh, command line scripting and multiple ways to add instances. Yeah, so it's this time to be automated. Um, many people that use DB Watch for this, um, uh, uh, adding the instance into into DB Watch is part of the automation when they create the instances. So multiple okay. ways yep. of doing it um, automated. You don't have to click, click, click. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> um, I suppose um, on that, so you showed um, for the FTL that you can run like SSH commands. Um, yeah. What's this? Someone is asking, is it only Linux they can run on or can they run on like Windows boxes for like DOS or PowerShell? Well, uh, SSH is SSH, so it can run on uh, any OS that um, have SSH. Uh, so you can connect to a Windows box with SSH. Uh, PowerPoint, no, sorry, PowerShell is uh, planned. Yeah, so it's um, it's on the list of things that we would support in the future. Yeah, lovely. Sorry, I'm a PowerShell maniac, so I'm loving that answer myself. Yeah. <laughs> And finally, someone's asking, um, so you can set up all these uh, queries and give them aliases and names. Can you also version control them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's built-in version control. Hmm. Yeah, so so when you, um, uh, uh, if you if you create, um, so uh, if you had the, for instance, the, the property um, uh, disk usage, yeah? You, if you have your own query and put it into the server, that will take precedence over the disk uh, usage that we provide. Um, but uh, you can also have uh, uh, different versions of the, um, uh, the, uh, the properties that it will pick the newest version when it runs. That's you, brilliant. You can, of, of course, uh, have different disk usage queries for different versions of SQL Server, for instance. or yeah. Yeah, or the different um, versions of the data stores themselves. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Um, and finally, it's a kind of a generic question. Then, someone wants to know what would you recommend to start with if you were dealing with uh, SQL farms. I mean, the the most important, uh, the first first step is to have total control. You know, to 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 know what you have. You know, um, so uh, typically when when um, if if DB Watch is used in in a um, uh, setup where um, there is a lot of databases, then you 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 start scanning the subnets for instances that uh, that you might want to add. Yeah, um, and then uh, because a, a lot of places, even even those that feel they have a lot of control, they tend to find instances that didn't know about. You know, and uh, I I worked as a DBA before DB Watch, and I was managing uh, 270 database instances. And uh, there would be uh, people installing databases without you getting to knowing it, you know, before before people say, "Eh, this doesn't have backup," and 
that's when you hear about, uh, hear about it the first time. So you need to to be in control, and you can have you can scan continuously to to get new uh, information of things that you haven't already added. Uh, but being in uh, uh, getting control and total overview is the first step, I think. Yeah, I think we've all encountered the shadow IT, and all of a sudden it's absolutely critical to the business. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's perfect. You've answered all the questions that I have, so thank you very much for that. Yeah. Okay. So, so this, uh, uh, if people want to try out DB Watch, it's uh, uh, you can go to our web page and uh, uh, download. Uh, um, if you register, you get um, I think uh, start up with a a month um, free use of the software for um, some instances, and of course. Um, um, this can be adjusted uh, if you talk to to uh, Andreas or to sales or to send to mail to support. Hmm. All right. So with that, we do appreciate you, Chris, so much for showing us all of this goodness. And with that. I uh, do thank, thank you all for joining us and see y'all next time. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, one quick thing. We are going to be giving away the $250. Um, we're going to pick somebody from the list uh, and give it away. Good reminder there, Steve. Good reminder. Just thought I'd put throw it in. Anyway, thank you guys for for sponsoring us, and uh, we really appreciate it. Amen. You're welcome. We enjoy working with you guys. Good deal. Same back at you. Hopefully, we spread your word around. <laughs> That's right. Hope so. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.